Joining us now is OG, okay? <laughs> the story is trending around the world. Hello, OG. Good morning, Dr. Oginika. Abati. Happy Friday. You know, Rufai did your Oginika two days ago. <laughs> How are you? I didn't even attempt. Yes, no, I did you. not. <laughs> I wasn't going to bother. No. Good morning, Tundun. Good morning. How are you? I'm great, thank you. Great. How are you? Good morning, good. Good morning, Rufai. How are you? Good morning, Oji. How are you? Good morning. Well, good morning to you, viewers. We begin what's trending in Nigeria. Reactions have continued to trail the British government's threat to sanction Nigerian government officials allegedly responsible for human rights violations. Well, during the debate on a petition signed by over 220,000 individuals, Member of Parliament Tom Tongahat accused former head of state Yakubu Gowon of looting half of the central bank before leaving office. Well, in response, the former head of state has described the minister's statement as ridiculous and concocted. He said he served Nigeria to the best of his ability and his achievements during those years are available to everyone. Let's take a quick listen to the MP's statement during the debate before we take some reactions. Who have taken from the Nigerian people and hidden their ill-gotten gains here. We know that our banks, sadly, have been used for that profit and for that illegal transfer of assets. And that means that the UK is in an almost unique position in being able to actually do something. I guess who, he who alleges must prove. A lot of people have come to um, Yakubu Gowan's defense. I'll take a tweet from Akimumi Adeshina, who wrote, Be careful of misinformation. His Excellency, General Yakubu Gowan, Nigeria's former head of state, is a man of great honor, decency, Honesty, amazing simplicity, humility, and integrity. I know him, a great and admirable elder statesman of Nigeria. His honesty and integrity are impeccable. Tundu. First off, I want to say that statement by that um, conservative MP was a disgrace, quite frankly. And he started off so well. His general speech was good. I mentioned it yesterday when we were talking to Professor Akinyemi, but I said I'm not going to dignify it by repeating that one line. He should just have omitted that line mm. because he spoke so glowingly of Nigeria's imagination, our creativity. He said the best book in the English language is Chino Achebe's Things Fall Apart and ruined it with this just casual slander. You know it's a pet peeve of mine when people just open their mouths and just defame people. And then he tacks on, or so I heard, as if that mitigates or in any way, you know, explains away what he has uttered. It's irresponsible of him to make such a statement, especially when it is untrue, it is undeserved. And I have to quote the good book. You're, you're going to call me pastor now. Yes, but really, pastor if, Yes, I feel very strange about it. A false accusation is as deadly as a sword, a club, or a sharp arrow. You cannot just say, throw things like that out there. It's completely wrong. So it negated every other nice thing he had to say about Nigeria, yes. insulting our former head of state right. in that way. Now, should the former head of state sue for defamation, Dr. Abati? Well, first, uh, Tom Tongenhardt, the uh, MP representing uh, Adam Bridge and uh, Mullen, chairman, Foreign Affairs Committee in the House of uh, Commons. I think uh, in this particular instance, just put his foot in. The first point to be made is to say that he owes uh, General Yakubu Gowan an apology. It is also within the rights of uh, uh, General Gowan uh, to sue for defamation because, as you yourself said earlier, uh, it is a trite uh, principle in law that he who alleges uh, must prove. Even in the, uh, in the UK, the burden of proof is on the person uh, making the allegation. And, of course, we inherited our body of laws. One of our sources is from the common laws of England. So I think he got carried away. Uh, and uh, there is, I've not seen any Nigerian uh, who has uh, supported him with regard to what he said. Because you recall that when uh, the uh, Gowan administration was removed on July 29, 1975, uh, General Yakubu Gowan was away in Kampala, Uganda, uh, attending the 12th uh, summit of the Organization of uh, African Unity. So. Uh, how would he have carted away half of uh, the uh, Central what Bank of mean? Nigeria? What does that you know? mean? And then he, he doesn't have a reputation uh, for that kind of, uh, you know, uh, corruption or whatever. I mean, this was a man who uh, led Nigeria through the Civil War and who uh, became a champion in and out of office of national unity. 
And up to today, as an elder statesman, uh, he's uh, highly respected. Uh, he's a very strong voice of reason in Nigeria. And I'm not surprised that, you know, the younger generation have spoken up in defense of General Yakubu Gowan. Uh, you quoted uh, Dr. Akinwa, the additional of, uh, you know, um, African Development yes. Bank. I've seen some young people criticizing him, uh, saying that, oh, he didn't speak up when we had answers. Now that uh, General Yakubu Gowan has been attacked, he's speaking up. You see, many young people in this country do not have a sense of history. And I guess that's in part because history is not taught in schools. So when they see, you know, uh, the older generation telling stories, saying the truth about the historical situation of Nigeria, they don't know about it. And, you know, um, technology gives you the opportunity to say whatever you want to say uh, these days, even when you don't know. Uh, Femi Fani Kaode has also spoken in defense yes. of General Yakubu Gowan. Um, uh, Shehu Sani has also spoken up uh, in defense of General Yakubu Gowan. So I think, in a sense, what has happened, there is a positive side to it. Uh, the MP has said uh, what he has to say. General Yakubu Gowan himself has said he's talking rubbish, you know, and many Nigerians have risen in his defense. And so, in a way, ironically, you know, General Yakubu Gowan gets a feeling, uh, even at old age, of how he's very well regarded. Uh, by Nigerians across generations. He's not the one defending himself. He just said the man is talking rubbish. Yes. It's other people, younger Nigerians, Correct. who are saying this is a great citizen who should not be rubbish. And I joined them in saying so too. We all do. Rafai, a quick comment from you. I mean, a quick comment. For me, that British MP should be flogged. He's talking bansa rubbish, big rubbish. And he doesn't have a sense of history. And I don't know why, you know, some of these uh, colonial masters think that we are still betrothed to them. He forgets that when General Yakubu Gowan was, was uh, overthrown in that coup, he was away in Kampala, like, like uh, Dr. Bati said. And the first thing he said was pray for Nigeria. And immediately he went to the UK, went to University of Warwick, where he got a PhD. So let me call him fully, Dr. Yakubu Gowan. And this man has done a lot as regards praying for the continued existence of our nation through the scriptural union. Pray for Nigeria. That has always been the phrase. He's a respected elder statesman. But one British MP somewhere that doesn't even know is the right from his left as regards history of Nigeria is talking. All right. It's reflective of them. But I have to them. say, um, I don't think he can be sued, unfortunately. He deserves to be. Parliamentary privilege. Okay, privilege. No okay, yeah. that's right. true. Unfortunately. unfortunately. We'll take another story. In Bialsa State, Nigeria, where a 17-year-old girl and three other women are currently battling for their lives after members of the police force allegedly opened fire on them at an open market. Reports indicate that the police officers, numbering six, claimed that the activities of the market women caused heavy traffic, which held up their movement. An eyewitness said the policemen started shooting into the air for traders and pedestrians to leave the roadside and pave way for their vehicle to pass. He added that the traders hesitated to comply with the directive, which led to one police officer opening fire at them. The police state command have said the officers have been detained pending investigation. I mean, we are crying and SARS every single day. There's got to be something to give. I mean, like I always ask, isn't there a law to prevent police officers or military men from, sh from shooting into the air? Well, Dr. Abati likes talking about the rules of engagement, yes. which we now can see is a figment of imagination quite clearly. But for me, what it says is the NSAS protesters' demands yes. about mental evaluation. It is so key because if you are not completely insane, why would you open fire on somebody because they were causing traffic yes. or they were hesitant to obey an order? Is that now punishable by death? Surely there's some kind of mental problem here. I want to keep talking about this. This is ridiculous. Only the other day, um, Ifani was shot by one of those uh, people in the convoy and the, 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 the left, their family helpless. It's really horrible. For no reason. For no if people are blocking the, the convoy, you can use your horn yes. in your car. Yes. You must you shoot people. There's a mental problem. Yes, I agree with you. And that's the number four demand of the Nigerian youths. Uh, number five, they were talking about welfare. But in number four, in that five for five demands, 
you know, they were talking about psychiatric or psychological evaluation of Nigerian policemen. Because the Nigerian youths who led the entire protest uh, had observed and had arrived at the conclusion that many people holding firearms, wearing police uniform in Nigeria, are mentally sick. And the only way you can address that problem is to subject them to regular psychiatric evaluation. Not to demonize them, no. but to make sure that anybody who is going to carry a dangerous weapon, you know, will be in a state of mind that will not require him, that will not compel him to behave in a subhuman manner. Now, in this particular incident that occurred in uh, Bayesa State, around the 7.45 a.m., uh, p.m., we were told that these policemen were, you know, trying to pass through uh, a busy market, be a night market, and then they, they alleged that the people did not leave the road for them on time. They started shooting into the air. Now, every time, security uh, agents in Nigeria, they will claim that, oh, they didn't shoot directly. They shot into the air. What does now, that even maybe mean? they should be banned from shooting into the air. This is what I have to be. This is the only because thing that has to stop. Each time they, they shoot into be. the air, you know, there is a body dropping on the ground. Well, if you read some of the uh, accounts, you know, one gentleman who was interviewed said, look, they damaged his uh, daughter's uh, yes. uh, legs. Yes. Right? So that uh, uh, bullet that went into the air yes. came and uh, uh, did a detour and hit somebody in the leg. They call it a ricochet. Is that what yeah, they call right. it? So as part of their rules of engagement, yes. all these security agencies, they have to tell these people, look, stop shooting into the air. And it also draws attention to something about the training. These people, I don't know the quality of training that they receive. So this shooting uh, live ammunition into the air and the, the bullet will develop a mind of its own mm -hmm. and uh, do 360 degrees and look for a human being, you know, look for blood and mm -hmm. kill somebody. No, it has to stop. Yes. Now a 17-year-old girl may be paralyzed. We'll take another story before I come to you, Rufai. As International Day of Elimination of Violence Against Women was marked on Wednesday, President Mohamedou Buhari announced via Twitter that his administration will conduct a review of all the existing laws and policy instruments touching on offenses of rape, child defilement and gender-based violence in demonstration of his administration's commitment to address violence against women. The event, which also marked the start of 16 days of activism, has seen advocates stimulating issues of gender-based violence while calling on governments to give more protection to women and girls. Meanwhile, in Kano State, the Hijba board, also known as the Sharia police, have arrested a police constable identified as Bashiru for alleged sexual exploitation of underage women. According to the Sharia police, the constable Bashiru and his friend Jamilu lured victims to a building allegedly owned by Bashiru before sexually exploiting them. Alarm was raised when a guardian of one of the victims, a 16-year-old girl, went missing for two days and was later found after neighbors alerted Sharia officials that they saw the girl at the building. The constable was arrested, while the friend Jamilu is still at large. Rufai, your take on these two stories. To, to prevent something that is very bad in society. I don't know why a police constable should be doing that uh, with an underage girl which is really very bad. Uh, but the second part to it, I hope and I pray that the president has the political will to do all he has set out to do as regards the rights of women. Correct. And which that should start from the north uh, by domesticating all those laws, child right law and every law, you know, that will protect the rights of a woman. And also, let's even have cultural debates in the north as regards the age of assent of marriage for a woman in the north, because that's still very big in disputes. You know, at what age should you even give a child out in betrothment or marriage to another man in the north as a mother? That's why I talk about strictly the political will. And concerning the police officers that shoot in the air, it's quite very sad. You, for, for not passing the road or for not giving them the chance to pass the shoot in the air, I'll shock you. The other day, I went somewhere in Worry, and uh, somebody told me that there was a military officer. I mean, there was a, there was a police officer that if I was going to an occasion, he could tell the police officer to accompany me just to be able to show my presence that I've arrived at the occasion. They would just throw two bullets in the air and I'll give them 4,000 naira. That's the kind of country we have become. And it, it, it needs a lot of introspection. We need to have this real conversation. Yes, as regards training. But apart from training, the society we are breeding, because yeah, 
In management speak, there's a big saying that culture will eat strategy for breakfast. And that's true. Uh -huh. So no matter the training and the strategy of training will be, what is the pervasive culture in society? Because if you train police officers and the culture is still wrong in society, that culture will eat strategy for breakfast. All so right. we should have strong introspections as regards this. Okay. Well, before we take um, the, your comments on Buhari, I'll talk about the Hizba board again, who has written a letter to a radio station expressing their concern on tagging of November 27th at, as Black Friday sales day. The Hizba board have asked the station to refrain from calling the day Black Friday because majority of inhabitants in Kano State are Muslim and consider Friday as a holy day. I mean, I think that the Hizba board is doing all that it can, it can do. For arresting police officers, for one, I commend them for doing that. Well done, Mr. <laughs> but then this sense. comes right along. I mean, I don't know what you well, make of this. Well, they have the right letter. to feel how they feel, yeah. and they're protective of the, of their Friday yes. because it's the Juma. But for me, I don't know why the word black is so demonized. Yeah. Black is not necessarily bad. Some people will say it's called Black Friday because retailers are always in the red at some point. And on Black Friday, you know that even if you've been in the red making losses, on Black Friday, you know you're going to be in the black making a profit. So from the accounting perspective, the word black is positive. Although the origins of Black Friday are something else to do with Philadelphia yeah. and traffic and what have you from the 1950s. But a lot of people find it, it's, it's a positive connotation. But there have been attempts to stop it being called Black Friday and change it to Big Friday. But that didn't Which I go with. I prefer Big, Big Friday, Friday but it hasn't to Black Friday. So the HISBA, yeah. the HISBA board can really market yeah, Big Friday they instead in Kano <laughs> State. But gender violence, yes. um, I was saying earlier, I don't understand why... Violence Against Persons Prohibition Act has not been domesticated in certain states in Nigeria. And unlike the Child Rights Act, that's only in the northern states, because it does address what Rufai mentioned about child marriage. So they haven't wanted to domesticate it because it interferes with their culture. But the Violence Against Persons Prohibition Act, that's a northern problem, not east, northwest, not central, southwest. Even Ondo State has not domesticated the one state in southwest, south, south, southeast. Five years on, some states just have not domesticated it. I don't understand why. Gender-based violence is a real problem, whether it's physical, whether it's sexual. Yes. Remember earlier this year, OG, it seemed as if every day we had some kind of we epidemic did. of rape yes, cases we did. earlier this year. It was so frightening. We have socioeconomic violence towards women, verbal violence towards women, psychological violence towards women. It needs to be addressed. Dr. Vati. Okay, well, I don't know how much time we still have left. First, on the letter by the ISBA board with regard to uh, Black Friday, if we take a look at that letter again, you know, it's addressed to, I think, the manager, <laughs> not the manager <laughs> of the radio station. And this, is the, this is the second time we'll be seeing officials, you know, uh, or persons exercising, uh, you know, authority in certain positions, writing extremely bad English. And if you also look at that letter, it is not letter of notification. It is letter of notification. So, you know, the, the quality of people who are given certain responsibilities in this country is very embarrassing. You know, manger, notification. <laughs> this is the, the author of this letter is the one that should, the actual, that should actually be flocked. That's one point. The second point about Black Friday. Yeah. Yes, Tudu, you are right. I mean, the Black Friday expression has been there mm. since uh, the 19th century when uh, Abraham Lincoln uh, declared that... Uh, uh, last uh, Thursday of November, Thanksgiving Day, right? But during the Great Depression, uh, any time there was any kind of uh, chaos, uh, you know, you could have Black Tuesday, uh, Black Wednesday. Uh, on one occasion, there was Black Thursday, you know, all those periods in American history when you had crashes. And it was until 1966 in Philadelphia when a, a philatelist uh, magazine began to use the expression uh, Black Friday, and to refer to the day of great profits for retailers, you know, when people will go out after Thanksgiving and they will go and shop, and the book, as you said, will be in black as opposed to red. So it's a day when customers have expectations that they will get a good bargain, and retailers themselves will make profit, and that has gone into a popular lexicon worldwide. Now, so it has nothing really to do with religious observances. The Isba board is talking about uh, Friday not being called Black Friday, uh, but it should be called Holy Friday because, you know, Friday is the day of worship 
uh, for Muslims. But, you know, let that Isba uh, person be reminded that, in fact, the word Friday is uh, the, uh, from the name of the Norse goddess. It's actually the name of a goddess, Freak. You know, and then it became translated into uh, Friday. So it even has uh, origins. The name itself has pagan origins. Pagan so name. let them be reminded. <laughs> so what we have seen here uh, is not just uh, a demonstration of uh, 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 ignorance. Uh, it's also a demonstration of intolerance. And it's also a demonstration of lack of capacity to write an ordinary letter properly. In school chat, there is a, we used to do letter writing. You know, in addition to composition, this is where you put comma, this is yeah. where you put full stop. If that had been a letter written in a YEC exam, that guy who wrote that letter deserves an F9. You right. do it in primary school. Now, <laughs> on, uh, on uh, President Buhari, yeah. I think it's good yeah. that President Buhari is talking about, uh, you know, gender-based violence and Nigeria's commitment to eliminating gender-based violence, building uh, the necessary database, reviewing existing laws. And that part about reviewing existing laws is uh, very important. The question to be asked is, how well do Nigerian laws protect the Nigerian that's, woman? That's what, uh, that is the key question. Yes, the uh, major piece of legislation as of 2015 is the Violence Against uh, Persons Prohibition uh, Act, which redefines you know, all this issue about rape and gender violence and all of that. And then you have some states, Ekiti, Lagos, Ebony, that have been very progressive and also coming up with laws, relevant laws. The Lagos law, I think, is a 2007 law. The Lagos law does not recognize spousal rape. They're not it, progressive it, enough. Uh, well, okay. Yeah, we, they can also review it. Yeah, this is the whole idea that, of these 16 yeah. days of activism. But you know that in Lagos, you have sexual offenders register. Yeah. In Ekiti, you have sexual offenders register. So it's an issue that we have to keep in the uh, front burner. And if you look at the uh, penal code, in fact, the penal code even allows you to engage in violence against uh, women. But there is a gender-based violence subsector. In their January to June 9th, uh, 2020 report, they indicated that it's still a serious problem in the country, and it is good to see uh, President Buhari providing leadership in this direction. Good point. We hope that it's not just promise, that there will be real consequential steps taken. All right, we'll take our final story real quick under entertainment. If we can pull that story up on Arise Fashion Week. Um, this year, the Arise Fashion Week is unveiling the next generation of designers from across the globe, where 30 designers under 30 years of age will compete for a total of 500,000 US dollars in prize money. The event, which will take place between the 5th to the 12th of December in Lagos, Nigeria, will be streamed globally. The 30 designers who would compete for this edition were unveiled this week, and here are some of the designers. Bibi, a sustainable design label from Nigeria, the designer whose name is Nabila Yusuf Kwande, is 23 years old. Then we have design label Bloke, another Nigerian whose real name is Faith Oluwajimi. He is 24 years old. From Ghana, we have design label Oyedo, the designer whose name is David Kusi Boyedo, is 30 years old. Then we have Clan, a Nigerian fashion brand owned by three sisters, 29-year-old Tenny Sego, 28-year-old Abba Sego, and finally, 23-year-old Tiwa Sego. Then from Germany, we have design label Colors by 21-year-old designer Zek Eli Miri. Then from Nigeria again, we have Destiny Nwadire, whose design label is called DNA by Iconic in Vanity. She's 22 years old. Also from Nigeria is a design label Elfrida Dali, whose real name is Elfrida Bakoya, she's 25 years old. And then finally, I believe that we also have um, Kenneth Ize, who is another Nigerian who won uh, the Arise Fashion Week um, competition prize money this year. I'm very excited for okay. these 30 designers. We're looking forward to yeah. it yeah. with yeah. great yeah. excitement. Keep also. So much talent. Thank yes. you very much, Reggie. Thank, Thank you. Thank you.